Thank you to everyone joining us today from across the country and around the world. I'm Michael Higgs, Program Manager here at Conscious Capitalism, Inc. On behalf of the CCI team, we appreciate you taking time to learn and grow in community with us. Today, we're excited to be sharing space with Dr. Marvin Carr, Director of the Walmart.org Center for Racial Equity, and Maha Juwaid, Co-CEO of Responsible Business Initiative for Justice. Conscious capitalists are always looking for fresh new ways to elevate humanity, change lives, and positively impact their communities through business. At-risk youth and those previously incarcerated are segments of the population that have potential to thrive in the workplace and society if given the chance and the right tools. The Responsible Business Initiative for Justice recently launched Unlock Potential, an innovative hiring program funded by Walmart that aims to provide meaningful career opportunities to at-risk youth, teaching them new skills and helping them stay focused on a path for success. Dr. Carr and Maha Juwaid will discuss this groundbreaking initiative, the reason behind its formation, how it creates opportunities for those in need, the longstanding effects for underserved communities and how success is being measured. This conversation will offer insight and inspiration for anyone looking to expand their conscious hiring practices, support a diverse workforce, and make a far-reaching impact. As many of you know, conscious capitalism is a philosophy that emphasizes the human nature of business, as well as a movement of business leaders from around the world, working to change the practice and purpose of capitalism as a means to elevate humanity. Conscious Capitalism Inc. is a nonprofit organization dedicated to catalyzing that movement by creating learning opportunities like today's session and building systems of support for practicing conscious capitalists through our senior leader network, membership and engagement with local chapters. Several times a month, CCI offers virtual gatherings like this as a way for the community to see how this philosophy takes shape in the leadership journeys and business practices of those in our network. Um, today's gathering will run for about 45 minutes. Dr. Marvin Carr, and Maha Juwaid will be in a fireside conversation for about 20 to 30 minutes, and then we'll transition to audience questions during the last 10 to 15 minutes of our session. Please do use the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen um, so we can get to as many of your questions as our time together permits. If you have any technical questions or issues, please email us at info at consciouscapitalism.org. And now I'm excited to introduce you to Dr. Marvin Carr and Maha Juwaid. Dr. Marvin Carr is director of walmart.org Center for Racial Equity and supports the team as a subject matter expert in STEM education, workforce development, public policy, and racial and social equity. Before Walmart, he was at the Institute of Museum and Library Sciences, first as a program officer for STEM and community engagement, then later as an evaluation officer. He has also spent time as a policy advisor to the Chief Technology Officer of the United States. Maha Juwaid serves as co-CEO of Responsible Business Initiative for Justice, sharing joint leadership responsibilities with co-founder and co-CEO Celia Ouellette. Previously, she served as, as Responsible Business in Initiative for Justice, Chief Strategy Officer, helping to oversee RBIJ's work with the business community to, advan to advance justice reform. Prior to RBIJ, Maha worked with several organizations that partner with the business community to advance access to justice policy and practice in the United States, Europe, and across the globe, including the Legal Aid, National Legal Aid and Defender Association, Kids in Need of Defense, and the Pathfinders for Peace, Just, and Inclusive Societies. She also spent nearly a dozen years in the federal executive branch and led the U.S. Department of Justice Office for Access to Justice and served as the executive director of the legal, uh, excuse me, as the executive director of the White House Legal Aid Interagency Roundtable. Maha also served as the U.S. government's subject matter expert for U.N. Sustainable Development Goal 16, Indicator Identification and Development. And without further ado, I would love to welcome them both to the screen. Thank you, Maha. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael, for that very kind introduction and for including mm -hmm. us today in this conversation. We're really grateful to the Conscious Capitalism 
uh, organization and network. So uh, today's really fun because we get to speak with my friend and colleague, Dr. Carr. How are you doing, Dr. Carr? I'm good today. How's it going, Maha? Going well, thank you. So we have these questions, you know, it's a fireside chat and we'll try to keep it lively and also be conscientious of the time that we have today with all of our guests. And really, you know, we're so lucky at RBIJ to have the support and leadership of Dr. Carr and Walmart in supporting the work that we're doing. So the first question really is to, for you, Dr. Carr, to share a little bit more about Walmart's commitment to racial equity and how your center that you're with was launched. Gotcha. Well, you know, Walmart has always been a people first business. Um, our purpose is to save people money and also to help them live better. And so we serve hundreds of millions of customers um, and have more than 2 million associates uh, across the world. And we are the largest employer of Black and African Americans in the United States. One of our core values at Walmart um, is respect for the individual, uh, which is foundational to our diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy. Um, and so what that led to is following the murder of George Floyd, um, the company um, and all of us, we had to stop and think about like, what else could we do um, in the face of this strategy? And so we wanted to go beyond our own operations um, and use our size and our scale and our influence um, to really think about what, how might we um, use Walmart to, to drive systemic change when it comes to um, these social issues we were, we were, we were, we were facing. Um, and so uh, we believe that business is imperative to our rich equity strategy. And so in June, 2020, Walmart and the Walmart Foundation committed um, to um, uh, investing $100 million over five years to create this new center for racial equity. Um, we're supporting the philanthropic initiatives in four key areas, the nation's financial, healthcare, education, and justice systems. Um, and these are systems we think that Walmart, with both our business and our philanthropy, can influence at the national or the local um, landscape um, through our shared value approach. Um, particularly in my work, which is in the criminal justice pillar, um, we really focus on collaborating with community-based organizations like um, uh, community-based organizations and national organizations like RBIJ, um, uh, who are who are who can work with the young people at the highest risk of criminal justice involvement. Um, for example, earlier this year, we invested 1.25 million dollars to a new grant um, to the Prison Fellowship, which is the world's um, oldest and largest prison ministry to really help them think about how to use a two-generational approach to deflect young people um, towards opportunities instead of towards prison. So um, all particular is very similar um, in that vein. Yeah, it's really remarkable, uh, Dr. Carr, that in this short time, you've really, I think, cemented yourself and your center as being a real um, force in the philanthropic community to advance racial equity. And the size of your grants, like you just described, I think is a game changer as well for nonprofits working really hard to advance this work. And so you mentioned Unlocked Potential. I know that's why a lot of our participants are here today. They want to learn more about that. And I feel really lucky. I, I You know, of course, but the rest of the, the folks listening in may not know as well that I'm, new, I'm newly in this role. But I've known about Unlocked Potential since when it launched and was very happily at a summit last spring that RBIJ hosted where it was announced with, with my uh, partner, Celia, and yourself. And so really, I've been so impressed. We are also grateful for the support and the collaboration, but personally, I've been very impressed with the approach. And it very much feels like this has grown out of an idea that you had to take the poverty to prison, to tackle the poverty to prison pipeline. And in collaboration, of course, not only with RBIJ, but our colleagues, Persevere, who helps to organize the community-based organizations that we're working with. We've all been um, working together as partners in this effort. So if you could please tell the audience a bit more about um, uh, unlock potential, but also why it, why it's important to you in terms of supporting this this project. So, I mean, I'll, start, I'll start from the very basic. Like most of the folks in philanthropy and in the criminal justice space, see the criminal justice reforms movement as this linear spectrum from prevention to aftercare combating recidivism. Um, but because of lived experiences that I've had um, as a person growing up in, in these communities, I know that it's not linear. Um, that this is actually an intergenerational, intercommunal cycle. And what we know is that the vast majority of investments in this space focus primarily on decarceration um, and on combating recidivism. And so um, using the power and the influence of our business, um, and particularly us being the largest employer of Blacks and African Americans in the country, we thought, how might we actually influence philanthropy, influence the larger corporate space um, by 
um, laser focusing investments in young people, especially young people that we know are at the most are the most likely to go to, um, to to end up in the justice system, and so our larger prevention criminal justice prevention efforts are really grounded in if you provide folks the opportunity with economic mobility, um, that uh, and you over invest in young people, particularly those who we know are the most likely to, to go to prison, not only do you unlock the, their potential to reach their full potential, you unlock the potential of business and society um, to, to, to not only to, to, to nurture and benefit from the access that these thousands and thousands of young people will have to opportunity. That's great. It's really, it's, it's really wonderful. And I also would love to, to just ask a little bit more about how this is a priority for walmart.org and the broader strategy that you just shared a moment ago around racial equity. You, you hit a bit there, actually. So I want to also respect that you've, you've shared a bit about that. But if there's more, if there's more to come. Yeah. Well, I mean, so although Walmart is the primary funder um, for this project, um, there are several other large um, national organizations that are involved, Delta Airlines, Ben and Jerry's, um, uh, you know, Virgin Hotel Group. And, you know, it's, it, it is as important for us to invest um, uh, in our employees as is our, in our community. Some folks might ask, why is Walmart worried about criminal justice reform, right? Why is Walmart worried about this group? I mean, in the communities where our customers feel safe walking from their homes to the neighborhood market. When they feel safe and secure walking from their parking lot into, this, into a Sam's Club. And then in community, communities where Walmart and Sam's Club have access to the full spectrum of talent, Walmart will reach its full potential and so will the communities and those, and, and those groups. So it's very important for us beyond just a good thing to do um, and beyond just doing well in communities, it makes perfect sense to overinvest in these groups, both as a community intervention and as a business imperative um, to really gain access to a talent pool. A lot of folks talk about at-risk youth, and I, I avoid the language, the deficit language, and that's why unlock potential is such an important, even the wording of it is so important because you can talk about young people who've been in juvenile justice um, involved, or young people who are survivors of trafficking in the deficit at risk youth group, I mean, um, uh, terminology, but letting them know, letting the communities know, letting companies know that they have this potential and all they need is an opportunity, their first chance. Um, and that can change their life, but also that can really change the trajectory of communities and your, and your company. It's wonderful. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think reflecting on the businesses that we've been engaging with in this work, what you've reflected is very much similar to what they've shared. Um, I know that you've been talking to the businesses, and I also can reflect a little bit more about what they've told us, but would love to get your sense first, and then I'm happy to chip in as well about why you think the employers we've gotten are so eager to participate. You know, I'll, 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 of course, I'll start with why I'll, I'll use some Walmart um, numbers for that, right? And so I mean, in addition to, wow, um, Unlike potential candidates will have access to a suite of opportunities through Walmart, right? And um, and our Sam's Club pilots. And so we really focus on things like upper mobility, approximately 75% of our salaried store and supply chain management associates started off in the same hourly positions that the unlocked potential candidates will have access to um, in our Dallas markets and Sam's clubs. Um, not only that, they will have access to um, opportunities like Live Better You. Live Better You is an offering we have for associates um, who work on the front lines in our stores um, uh, to, um, uh, to access um, uh, higher education. Um, our Black hourly associates um, were 88% more likely to receive promotions um, if they were participating in Live Better You, which is our academic access program. We have Walmart Academies. And so not just, they're not just getting a job, right? They're getting access um, to Walmart's larger talent, talent pipeline. And I think other companies um, greatly benefit from those same things. And so we're really encouraging all the companies who are involved, not just to hire someone to fill a spot, but to involve these young people in your larger talent strategy, right? The same way that you would involve a, young, a group of cohort of young people graduating from an Ivy League institution, the live experiences, um, the, the, the go-get, the, the, 
the go givenness of these groups are going to blow your mind and they're already blowing minds um and the, the pods that have started and so it's really important um i think for colleagues not just in retail right because you see it's very, we, these aren't just retail jobs you have delta airlines you have jiffy Lou. there's there, it, it runs the gambit of um of opportunities here Absolutely. And yeah, definitely. I mean, I love hearing from, from the Walmart perspective with Sam's Club in particular, but also what you've shared, we've heard from our other businesses engaging exactly as you said, that a lot of folks, and I think a lot of the people listening in today, we all started somewhere and some and some folks who have been in their business have been there from the ground floor and were able to then progress over time and have that real mobility. And so again, we also are hearing from businesses that they want to do the same. They want to give the opportunity to individuals, to youth today, so that they can also um, rise to the ranks of their of their companies. And some of some of these executives themselves um, also have become the business owners over time. So having that as being a sample and a model for youth who have these potentials of this unlock potential and the, and the risks associated with with if if you don't give them potential, what that might mean for them. I'll also say we've been hearing increasingly around um, the desire of employers to really um, commit to the diversity of you know trying to have diverse talent pools, yeah. really create a real sense that their DEI commitment is is genuine. It's not yeah. just something flashy that's placed on their on their website. And when we think about DEI, of course, there's so many metrics, but it also the inclusion of around thinking about individuals whose families are have um, problems or that they themselves might also eventually, if not, but for opportunity given to them, they may have opportunities that pull them into a different life altogether. Um, and the last thing I'll say also in my own reflections here is that um, I think what's been really wonderful about Unlock Potential and it being a resource for employers is that you get some support to do it. We also know that a lot of smart, savvy business folk, employers don't want to do it wrongly. They don't want to create problems, not just for themselves, but for the individuals they're bringing into their business. And they want to do it in a thoughtful way that allows for individuals to grow and not be not be harmed by being placed into a program that feels opportunistic. So, you know, having the support of RBIJ, Persevere, having a community-based organization in the mix, I think is just a wonderful way of thinking about a wraparound approach to, to providing support. And I'll, and I'll add one other thing. So in my, early in my career as a White House staffer and with some awesome, awesome mentors, um, I remember watching, you know, the Thousand Opportunity Project um, for Opportunity Youth Emerge. And one of the great things about Unlock Potential is I think it addresses what a lot of youth opportunity, youth um, workforce development initiatives have lacked. And that is, I think um, you have to do, you have to both support businesses, but also support um, the communities who will be providing the business access to the young people. And so one of the unique attributes of the program is that it's not one grant to one grantee, there are two grantees. There's RBIJ who was curating the business community, who was giving the business community training, who was giving the business community um, uh, uh, points about how to connect to the young people. One of the last things I wanna point out too is that Persevere is running what is called the Unlock Potential Institute, which is building out a national infrastructure of organizations that businesses can tap into to support wraparound services. These young people um, are primarily fall in four categories. Young people who have parents in prison, who we know are six times more likely than their peers to go to prison themselves. Young people who are exiting the juvenile justice system, young people who are at the highest risk of um, of aging out of foster care and, and survivors of human trafficking. And so that is who these jobs are focused on because we know that they are the most likely to go to, to end up in prison um, themselves. And so with, with the work of Persevere, providing the wraparound services and the training for the young people to ensure that, that they have the emotion, the social emotional learning that they that is needed to be successful in the workplace. And then RBIJ doing the same thing, connecting um, to ensure that employers have the cultural competency to support the young people. Um, and they bring the two together and unlock potential um, uh, is just ripe for just amazing, amazing outcomes and outputs. Absolutely. And we're so grateful to persevere, led by Elisa Malone, our dear colleague there, who's just, you know, really um, the opportunity to partner with an organization that's expert on community-based organizations and these wraparound services has been such a such a gift to RBIJ in doing this work. 
So we've been talking about all the positives, but of course we want to we want to also talk about the challenges. They're not the negatives; they're the challenges, and that that might have you know some of it might come back to me as well. I know in talking about some of the challenges we've picked up from our um, employers as we move forward. But to throw it first to you, what are what have been some of the challenges in launching the pilot and your sense of how we've overcome them or how we you know continue to overcome them? No, I think whenever a, a large employer or a large philanthropic organization with Walmart, like Walmart and the Walmart Foundation gets into this kind of work, um, it's so easy to parachute into communities to help them solve problems. Um, and so one of the things that we learned is that as we're doing these pilots and then as it scales hopefully over the next several years, that, that so much of the success of the project has to do with local context. Um, and so this is not something that can be ran out of the Walmart home office or the Ben and Jerry's home office, that you have to empower local people leaders, you have to empower local executives um, to, um, to really take ownership of the program. Um, and so that's something that we caught on to very early with this project, um, particularly when we think about the Sam's Club pilots, we're, we, we, um, this is not something that is owned by Sam's Club or Walmart corporate, that we are inviting and encouraging our local leaders, just leaders at our, at, our local, at our local clubs, our local people leads to be a part of the learning process so that they are the local champions. So that's very important. Um, and then lastly, I would say that this doesn't work everywhere, right? There's a, there's a reason that, you know, Delta Airlines and Ben and & Jerry's have chosen the geographic locations. Um, and that is because you have to ensure that you have the resources in place um, because you don't want to start a program and disappoint the young people um, and re-engage them in that cyclical and uh, in, in that cycle of, of, ups, um, of disappointment that often leads to recidivism or that often leads um, uh, leads to negative outcomes like prison. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Another letdown in a, in a life full of opportunities that were uh, not provided. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll very much reflect the same things that you said, that it's not a one-size-fits-all, this approach. Yeah. The idea that an employer is choosing to become a more inclusive employer by um, creating opportunities for, for young people um, means that each employer has to do it in a way that's natural and right for them. And then the benefit, of course, of the program is that then you have the resource of RBIJ and, and our colleagues at Persevere to make sure that as you develop your program, you have the support you need. But we've also, you know, have, have confirmed that each employer has a different pace that they need to follow. We, of course, are trying to run a pilot program and have metrics and markers and that we want to hit milestones. But we, at the end of the day, there is unexpected realities, both economic uncertainty in the country that actually obviously impacts businesses and what they can and can't do. And so what we've really learned and the challenge that we, and the way we've overcome it is to be flexible. We know that for employers to be able to um, uh, participate in programs like this one and actually robustly engage in uh, a new way of hiring that they need to do so in a way that's potentially incremental and that's absolutely fine and okay. Uh, I will say though that, and I know you know this very well, but for for the for our audience, when the program was launched, we thought we would start with five five businesses so that mm -hmm. we could do it well, do it correctly. But we've really we're at eight. We've had far more interest that's allowing us to consider uh, future years worth of work so that we can help other businesses develop similar programming. Um, and on that front, maybe I'll throw it back to you to say what's next for the UP program. Um, I'm excited about UP. I, I'm excited about not just the change for the young people, right? So like, that's important. Like they, 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 the end product is access and opportunity so young people can reach their full potential. What I'm most excited about is how this project might shift the narratives and mindsets among executives and people leads and HR folks in our companies um, to think about this group of young people as worthy of an investment, um, to think about this group of young people as future leaders of their companies, uh, future CEOs, um, and, and to really make this as much as, as much about racial equity and opportunity creation as it is, uh, as much as it is about um, uh, giving your organization up an upper hand when it comes to talent, right? And so it's so easy. I've been involved in um, kind of, um, equity, gender, racial, environmental equity focused work for quite a long time. This is my um, first time in the, in the corporate space. And the, 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 the most important 
thing that I've learned um, is, the, is the concept around shared value, right? Mm -hmm. That when companies invest in communities um, in ways that extend and complement their business value, the communities end up doing well. The communities end up benefiting from the success of the company. Um, and so, um, so what's next? I hope, right? I, I'm just a funder. You are the implementer of this project, um, along with Persevere and others. Um, my hope is, my hope is that, you know, I'm not looking for, I'm not hoping for numbers, right? It's not like we want to, you know, have a hundred thousand young people employed in the next three years. No, my hope is actually um, far more focused on on influence the decision making of business leaders and influencing the decision-making of community-based organizations. How can we build trust between community leaders and business leaders that the businesses will take care of our young people? Um, how can we build trust between business leaders and communities that the community leaders will prepare um, and bring them young people who, are, who, who um, have the potential to really, to really support their companies? And so, um, it's, it, it, is, it is as much about opportunity for young people as it is about um, creating the space for adults like you and I um, to bring these young people into their full potential. I love it. And, you know, it's like we're so good with our timing. I think our conscious capitalist colleagues will be so happy because I have one last question. It's for both okay. of us. That is it's really building on what you just said, which is to say, you know, we're talking to conscious capitalists today. So what message would you leave with them? around how to get involved, whether or not it's directly an unlocked potential, how they should also get involved in supporting youth in our in our country. Yeah, so uh, one of the things that I realized is that we haven't defined youth or the why, right? And so, I mean, you can use, you know, um, you know the US Health and Human Services definition of, of, of opportunity youth, right? 16 to 24 out of work um, and out of school, or we use a more general term, which is, young people age 16 to 30 um, who need access to opportunities, right? Um, and so my hope is that the opportunity youth movement um, uh, is an input into not just your companies or not just the larger, not, not just your company's um, uh, CSR or racial equity or um, community outreach work, um, but that they become an integral part of your larger human capital proposition. Um, that I, I promise you that when you give access to young people to opportunity, they will they will take it. Um, and and lastly, I would say that I never want to I never want to like this is exciting work, um, but I never want to forget that we're that this that there's a purpose of this larger than economics it is that these young people um because of systemic issues because of systemic inequities um are going to prison right um and because they're going to prison all of our companies all of our communities are missing out on the contribution that they might instead make not just to our bottom lines but to the but but to the to the success of our communities and of our country and of our world um and so that in part, I think, is the grounding of this. Is we're 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 also giving these young people the opportunity for economic mobility. We're also protecting them in our country from um, uh, from a prison system that would otherwise remove their input into the world. Absolutely, yeah. And I'll, I'll I mean, I'll a hundred percent. I'll say that you know, my life has been, my career has been in the justice space. The business angle has been increasing over the last few years, and so I too feel newer into connecting um, the business, my understanding and my passion around improving uh, outcomes for folks across the country, especially in the justice context with the business community. And so what I would say is that for those listening in, and there, this has been interesting for you and hopefully has taken your imagination to a place of considering how you might implement similar programming, I would also just leave with you the idea that everyone's responsible for increasing and improving justice in this country. You know, oftentimes the, the legal system is so complicated, unnecessarily so, but also there's a sense that 
It is judges in black robes and lawyers in suits that determine justice outcomes for folks, but it's, it's not true. We all do. It's the way we treat each other, but it's also the opportunities we give to each other. And finally, it's also considering for, for I've been studying up on conscious capitalism, better understanding your four tenants. And I will say so much of what you're reflecting there, I think is also in the way that uh, those of us at RBIJ in partnership with amazing businesses like Walmart have found that thinking about all your stakeholders is really critical and re-examining the ways in which you do your work. So that's employment, of course, but it's also thinking about your supply chains, it's thinking about how your products are sold and go into the world and how they all intersect with the justice system. So I would leave that as, as my, my parting message until we get to the Q&A, but that really brought it together. And justice is not a separate sector that no one touches, but those who have law degrees, it really is for all of yeah. us to consider ways to improve the very complicated nature of our justice system in the U.S. It's been such a pleasure. I'm not going to say bye because we have a few more questions, I'm sure, from the yeah. earlier too, but it's been it's been fun, Marvin. It's been fun, Dr. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, indeed. Uh, thank you, Marvin. Thank you, Maha, for a for a wonderful conversation. And, uh, you know, that final comment that you made, Maha, about considering the legal system as a stakeholder. Um, yeah. Very, very enlightening and illuminating. So thank you for that reflection. Um, I do want to jump into a couple questions from our audience, um, and just a reminder to all of our guests who have joined today, you're welcome to use the Q&A feature, as some of you have done already, to, uh, to ask your questions of both Maha and Marvin um, as they share their answers. Uh, the first one um, is from one of our guests, uh, Callie, and she asks, she says, what barriers are you seeing with businesses integrating fair chance hiring um, and what helps them make that shift to engage? Yeah, I'm happy to start if unless Dr. Carr. Yeah, I think I think the idea is how fast and how big do you have to go? I think the beauty of this program is as Dr. Dr. Carr suggested, there's no target that you have to have X number of folks employed at the beginning. And I think that has been a question mark for some businesses who are interested but unsure. Success is one, you know, because one will grow to two and three and four. Once you put the systems in place to allow you to be a, an employer that cares about the needs of your employees beyond metrics, then I think constructing a thoughtful program, starting starting small is an okay and a right way to approach it. And really the, the most important thing is to find community partners to help you both identify candidates that can be successful. And again, for us in this instance, we're thinking about youth who have these in, in for unlock potential, these four um, categorizations that Dr. Carr mentioned, but for any, any reality in the way you're thinking about trying to have a more inclusive workforce, working mm -hmm. with a community-based organization that can help identify candidates, but then can help you also make sure you have the services in place either internally or in partnership with other organizations to provide that wraparound care that individuals need to be able to be successful. Dr. Carr, do you have other ideas? Um, and you know, one of the, I, I love the, the field transition to the term fair chance hiring. Um, when we first started this program, um, it was originally called, called the First Chance Initiative, right? <clears throat> Um, and it was a response to the larger work of the second chance, right? Giving folks second chances, so combat recidivism. Um, and I think what's really important in the fair chance movement um, is that um, that the fair chance movement be as much as about, be as much about the people as it is about the processes that our businesses put people through, right? Um, and the processes that are meant to um, uh, to sift people out instead of into process, uh, to organizations. And so you can create processes that start with opportunity uh, instead of starting with, you have this experiences, this, this experience, which means you are not worthy of employment with our company. Right. And I think that's what this program gets to is how do we shift the mental model? How do we shift, how, shift the narrative about people who the large society might think of as undesirable, but we know that they have so much to offer to our companies and to our larger community. That's great. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I have another question here. Um, you know, for, for smaller companies that may not have the resources to uh, participate um, in a program like the one that you've developed, 
um, you know, businesses that may have revenue, say between 1 million and 5 million or, or small teams of five to 20 people, um, how, how, how might they engage or adopt? Um, and then an add-on question is, it sounds like you're, you know, in the future, you're sort of creating an opportunity for smaller companies to benefit from um, all of the, the resource building that you're doing as part of your program. Um, how, how can smaller businesses connect with um, people that, you know, may be looking to, you know, uh, change jobs or change careers and, and, and there's opportunities in small business um, for people that have gone through your program? That's great. I'll, ahead, I'll start. So, so I think one of the, the, the important thing is that what we're funding is creating the infrastructure for those businesses to tap into, right? Um, and so that infrastructure includes the awesome um, content that RBIJ is creating for companies. Um, Grayston Bakery, I think about the smaller companies um, that um, has signed on to uh, like potential. Um, I think about the Colum the Columbus, Ohio cohort of, of, of healthcare focused organizations that aren't the big Walmart or the big Deltas or the big you know uh, Virgin uh, groups. And so what we what we have is eight very different types of companies, different sizes, right? Different industries, um, different approaches to talent. Um, and what will come out of this, hopefully at the end of the two years, is a suite of um, publications and a suite of material that all types of companies will be able to use to inform how they might interact with the community to, to access this talent. At the same time, Persevere and the, and the Online Persevere Institute is creating its own series of playbooks mm. um, that companies that, sorry, that nonprofits on the ground can use to build their own, both um, um, uh, both their own hiring programs, but also to inform how they um, uh, attract and, and attract talent to, to support the companies. And so this is more than just giving kids jobs. This is how do we create products that companies and nonprofits can use to build their own, their own relationships. Walmart, you know, won't be, won't fund this for 10 years. Walmart won't fund this for X amount of years. And so the hope is that the environment um, and the infrastructure is in place that companies naturally know that they can go to the Online Potential Institute or to local organizations that have been, that have, that have been through the training to access the young people and their, and the wraparound, wraparound supports. Yeah. Am I going to miss anything? No, hundred percent agree. And I'm so glad you mentioned Grayson because we know that Joe Kenner is on the board of CCI, so we would be very remiss not to mention that Grayson is a participant, not surprising, I think, for the, the conscious capitalist community here, but that really um, we are endeavoring to make the resources available more broadly. You know, the, the thanks to the generosity of Walmart, this participation in this program is free to the businesses. So we're, we don't have a pay to play model in terms of supporting. We just have a capacity issue that at some point we just simply don't have enough staff to be able to support all the businesses. But what we're hoping to do, and this is the pilot year one, future years is fine tune the approach so that we really can be helpful beyond doing the one-on-one -on -one with businesses. Because we also know, and this is really goes back to um, a bit of who and how RBIJ operates. There's a piece of this too, where businesses peer to peer can be more supportive even than nonprofits engaging businesses, you know, again, RBIJ being a nonprofit. So that if we can change the environment and the climate around thinking about inclusive hiring and have businesses go through these processes in an effective way, they can be the best messenger to supporting other businesses to doing, doing similar things. Wonderful. Um, yeah. And uh, we would be remiss without mentioning Joe Kenner. In fact, uh, someone uh, brought Grayson up in the Q and A. So, um, wow. wonder, yeah, wonderful work that that Joe's doing um, with open hiring, uh, Grayson. Um, we have a question here, um, uh, touching back on 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 sort of the business side. Uh, the question is, what are the business shareholder value arguments that you found successful? Uh, with hesitant or resistant companies? 
um, so where, where you've encountered friction. Um, this particular guest, uh, um, their firm engages portfolio companies on fair chance employment, um, particularly with proactive recruitment of people with criminal records, um, but they get pushback in the form of a lack of ROI or companies saying that they're not ready, uh, they're, or companies saying that what they do already is good enough. Um, and essentially what advice might either of you have on, on getting some traction when you encounter that resistance? Yeah. I think we're being polite looking at each other through that. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll start since I don't have the good, the right answer for this. Sure, um, sure. So I'll start and I'll give it to you, my Okay. Happy <laughs> to. Yeah. I mean, really, I think, I think the idea, number one, there is a lot of studies that show at least in the second chance space. And of course we're talking about fair chance hiring individuals have not yet been caught up. They may have a juvenile justice uh, related uh, record, but that's different from an adult, but all to say there is really good studies out there that when you give opportunities to individuals who have this connection and potential connection to justice involvement, that they are more loyal because people need jobs and need opportunities. So there are studies out there and we're happy to share, share them with you. I think obviously that's always very helpful is to have some statistical economic argument that can go along with it. But I also think really all of this is a matter of, I mean, you're doing so much. And so I don't want to suggest you can't do this, that we want you to do this as well. But Mari, reading your question and seeing the other things you're doing, the idea is, you know, it's little by little, like there's a piecemeal incremental approach to having more inclusive workforces. And I and I think also what we could benefit what you can benefit from us is we have a website. I know that it's probably in the materials and we're happy to post it here as well but unlock hyphen potential. And we are continuing to post information there about what's coming out of this work, including the wonderful ways in which business leaders are talking about this work. So that again, the inspiration from peers might be influential for those um, in your organization and your business that may have questions around um, how and what to, how to approach this work. So Really, the answer is that the pie is big. You can you can take as many pieces as you want to get to the place of a fully inclusive environment. But I also just want to acknowledge and uh, applaud you for what your your company is already doing. It's pretty remarkable. But yes, we'll help you to do more. And there's some good studies out there that we can absolutely ensure that you have access to. Thank you, thank you, Michael. Pest. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, and then, you know, we're, we're close to time here. Um, so we did have a, uh, we did have a question, um, someone complimenting the session. Um, so both compliments to you, Dr. Carr and you, Maha, for, for this session and this conversation. Um, is there, uh, Dr. Carr, is there any way that uh, someone can find out more about your work at walmart.org? Is there... Anything Absolutely. And so or... <laughs> um, if you could put in the chat there, everyone. So um, if you go to walmart.org, um, you will see lots of our, um, our, our, our larger work at Walmart. Um, when we actually think about um, our role on regeneration, right? How do we become a more regenerative company, um, which goes beyond our work and sustainability and our ESG work and our racial equity work. And so I invite you all to explore walmart.org. Um, I think we're going to be having um, a new blog post coming in a few weeks about um, uh, one of the, uh, uh, we've reached a milestone in our giving. And so you, you should be able to see that in a couple of weeks coming out. Um, but yes, there are lots of resources and information that you can find on walmart.org. Wonderful. Um, well, I want to thank you both so much for joining us today. Um, you know, again, appreciations for for this conversation um it's been insightful informative and and actionable for for our attendees um and to our attendees thank you for spending your your morning or your your afternoon with us um if you do have 30 seconds um i do have a short survey which i will put into the chat for everyone um it does help us with future programming um if you're new to conscious capitalism uh please visit our website, consciouscapitalism.org for more information about our movement and our organization. Um, if you are executive currently implementing conscious practices in your business, um, we invite you to explore our senior leader network. You can find information about that on our website. Um, and we also have some more virtual gatherings happening in the uh, month of April. So 
check out the events page on our website. And uh, again, just a immense gratitude, uh, Dr. Carr and Maha for this conversation today. Um, and if anyone is wondering, we will be sending out a recording of the session uh, with some additional uh, materials, uh, ways to uh, connect with um, both Maha, uh, Maha's organization, as well as uh, walmart.org. So thank you both again for, uh, for your time today. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Carr. Thank you.